Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Product Thinking Podcast. Today, we're joined by Darren Wilson, who's the Chief Product Officer at Soul Machines. This is the company who produces digital people through the use of cutting-edge AI technology and animation artistry. He's helped secure customer user growth quarter on quarter, and he's been evolving the platform to meet the ever-evolving generative AI landscape. His career has seen him go from London to New York to New Zealand at both companies big and small. But before we start talking to Darren about this really exciting landscape, it's time for Dear Melissa. This is our segment where you can ask me all of your burning product management questions. Just go to dearmelissa.com and drop me a line and let me know what you want me to answer on a future podcast. All right, this week's question. Dear Melissa, can you explain the difference between product ops roles and strategy and operations roles? I'm seeing both on my job hunt and there seems to be some overlap in the job descriptions. Great question. Okay, so strategy and operations roles are interesting to me because they vary greatly depending on the organization. In some organizations, I've seen them sit out, actually, I'm going to say many organizations, I've seen them sit outside of product management and not inside product management. And in those roles, they have been kind of looking at the market um, looking at, you know, where should we play? Uh, who are the personas we should target? What kind of industries are out there? And they're doing things like TAM and SAM segmentation, stuff like that. Um, and usually that's being fed into the product management team, but it's very much, uh, you know, calculating those things out and trying to figure out where the strategy is. Now, in some organizations, I've seen them define the product strategy or define what should be built and then hand it down to the product organization. I want to say that I think that's bad. I don't think you should be separating out strategy and product management into two different organizations. I think they need to live together in a software company. If you're doing a lot more than software, I could totally see where that that operates. And maybe you will find that in, you know, organizations that are more than software, not SaaS companies, right? Like it could be stripped out then. I could see it as a broader overarching corporate strategy type thing. I get that. In a software company, though, I believe that product and strategy go hand in hand and we should not separate those out. So you're going to have to ask yourself, in the strategies and ops roles, are those for product or are they for the company in a broader part of the organization? That would be a key difference between that and product operations. Product operations, you may be doing stuff like TAM segmentation or SAM segmentation, which could definitely help the product team. That's that market research aspect of it. Um, or you could be working on many other things. Product operations, really the goal here is to remove obstacles from doing great product management and doing great product strategy. So when we break it down into the three pillars, there's many different places that you could actually play. If you're leading a team, you're kind of bringing all these things together. But I would really ask the organization what they mean by product operations. You could be doing things like helping to, um, to bring in the, the right products, let's say, to view strategy so that you're helping um, to bubble up to leadership and to the rest of the product managers, like the, the stats and the health metrics on their products, the dashboards that they're going to be looking at, the metrics that they want to refine. Um, you could be bubbling up insights even on you know, what customers are doing. Sometimes there's more of a data component to it. So you're going to want to find out, is it, is it data related? Um, other times it could be more uh, streamlining user research focused, right? Like it could be uh, trying to standardize how we go out and collect the uh, research and where do we put it? What repository should it live in? How can we help make it easier for people to talk to customers? That's our customer market research area. Or it could be on the governance side. It could be helping with things like uh, templates, rolling them out, making sure they're consistent, finding the right tools. There's a lot that kind of goes into product operations. So you're going to want to ask how that company defines it and really what they're looking for. Uh, in product operations too, you might be playing a role uh, cross-functionally. So maybe you're working with the sales team to make sure that all the sales information actually ends up in product. So if they're talking to a customer and they request a feature list or something like that, uh, it makes its way to product. That feedback is actually pulled out of their systems. We can look at that great uh, information that they're capturing, talking to potential customers or active customers, and we can use that to refine our product. So a lot of definitely goes into product operations. Depending on what company, what size company you're looking at, the larger it is, I would say the more specific um, the product operations role might be. From a perspective of you might be doing one of those things that I just mentioned, and it might be 
something where you granularize who's doing what. In a smaller company, you might be looking at all of product operations and trying to figure out, how do I make product management better here? So it really depends on what size company you're looking for and where you want to act. I'd say product operations is always going to sit much closer to the product management team. The strategy and operations role usually is a little bit broader over the whole company. It may be working closely with product or it may be working with sales. It may be working with CEO. You're going to want to say, see how they actually define what strategy and operations means to them at those companies. Because it is very different company to company. Uh, Product operations is still new (laughs) and definitely coming out there. So I could totally see where somebody might be calling it a strategy and operations role, but there's a lot of product operations that plays into it. They might be using that language right now, but I'd say product operations is emerging. It's just getting started. Um, It's getting a lot of momentum though. So you're going to see it more standardized as we go out there. Uh, I would just look at the strategy and operations role and try to figure out what level of the company is it playing on? Is it corporate or is it more granular working with the product team? If it's working with the product team, there might not be a huge difference between a strategy and operations role and a product operations role. It might be the same thing if it reports into the product team. I hope that clears it up. I know there's not a really cut and dry way to explain those two things and the differences now. And I think that's because of the way that companies explain them in the job description. Uh, In our book, that Denise and I wrote, Product Operations, we do define the job roles of product operations pretty explicitly in there and who you should be hiring and looking at. So that might give you um, a good idea on what product operations could entail and if it's close to strategy and operations. And you can also get those job descriptions on our website at productoperations.com and you can look at those roles there. I compare that to what you're seeing with strategy and ops and try to figure out, is it the same or is it different? All right, so that's it for Dear Melissa this week. Again, if you have a question for me, please go to dearmelissa.com and drop it off so that I can answer it in a future episode. Now it's time to talk to Darren. Welcome, Darren. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. So you are chief product officer of a really interesting company called Soul Machines, which makes digital humanoids, which is a long way away from, I think, what we think about as you know, caricatures online like Wallace and Gromit, <laughs> which was years ago. But how, you know, how did Soul Machines uh, get started? And how are you harnessing AI to bring in these very lifelike uh, images of people? That's a very good question. And um, yeah, it's been a while since someone's mentioned Wallace and Gromit to me. So maybe, maybe we'll get back to that later <laughs> so I can try to remember. Soul Machines was started by Mark Sager. Uh, he was a special effects guru working on blockbuster movies. Uh, and his area of special- speciality or was uh, uh, motion capture, particularly around the face on large, on ma- major movies. Um, at the time of working on those films, he developed uh, some technologies to support that work. Um, that span out into a research project that ultimately became Soul Machines. And his big thing or his big story was really about the face being access to uh, an emotional connection for users and for people beyond the using technology beyond the way that we're used to. So he built uh, these digital avatars that could connect to customers potentially in, in more empathic ways. Um, I joined the company five years ago to introduce a level of kind of design thinking as well as as well as um uh product thinking or attempt to bring some product thinking into what was at that stage a very research focused engineering led team um and uh, so the 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 challenges the challenges that we had at that stage were kind of building a, a design and product team to to try to help not just um, a very engineering-led company evolve into more product-led, which is which is where we are today, but also transition from kind of a very vision-based company that trying to an aspirational kind of selling uh, a major vision to to big enterprises to actually democratize the process of building digital people so that more uh, smaller companies can work on and build and create digital avatars for their own unique use cases. And what are those use cases? Like, who needs digital avatars? So that's a very good question, and um, I'll be honest. It's been a, we're still we're still in the process at the moment of trying to identify those like unique use cases that actually bring real value. A lot of the work that we've done up to this stage 
and you, you asked about the connection with AI, and I'll come back to that shortly. A lot, a lot of the work that we've done at this stage has been around kind of the, democratizing the, the ability to create avatars and also reducing the time for, to build these very um, realistic, customized faces and unique faces um, from three to six months to build to, to 30 minutes really for an individual to try and create them. The original pitch, the original opportunity that, that was, a, was being explored at Soul Machines as I came on board was digital assistance to help with a sales drive or to replace a call center or to connect your customer to your brand in a very personalized way. What we're starting to find, really, the value that we're starting to explore as we've kind of opened up the platform to get more users on board through our free tier, um, as opposed to the previous model where we charged a lot of money for kind of a long-term project, the use cases we're starting to see are really getting to be super interesting where it's actually where an empathic kind of um, really personal connection is useful so rather than being an area of kind of transactional kind of interface which is what effectively the internet is about today and digital media is today we're very transactional very get in get out um what we're finding the digital the digital avatar doesn't work very well in that space the, there's limitations with the technology the uh, the response delays too is too great so inserting something like a you know a, a fake face or a fake human between an experience that people are used to is actually not very successful. But what, what, where we are finding that there are successes is helping people make difficult choices or helping people have difficult conversations or practice difficult conversations. For example, this interview today, I've done a couple of times with an avatar where I had the avatar playing your role uh, and helping me stumble through words. And and that practice, the loop, kind of without judgment and talking to an emotional face that actually connects to you is super effective and super useful. So one of the big use cases is really language practice. You know, we had a Korean influencer who used um, one, of our, one of our avatars um, a couple of months back to practice kind of speaking English and to practice, practice responses. So it's that it's that engagement without judgment is is an area that we're exploring. That's a really cool use case. I can see. I like. I like the idea of the practicing without judgment. Like I um, personally speak really awful Italian, but it's because I can't practice, so I can understand it extremely well. But I'm so afraid to go practice it because everybody just kind of looks at me weird, um, and I don't get a chance to speak with native speakers. You know, living in South Carolina, where actually I did find two people who speak Italian here, which is very random, but That's wouldn't right. expect it. Um, but I don't get to talk to them as often. So I've always, I've been like, man, I wish I could, uh, could practice more. And I've looked into like other courses, but I love the, the AI, the AI component of that too. Like not having a real human there judging you, <laughs> judging your, uh, your feedback and knowing that it's okay to say like whatever you want. I think what we found is that we, we sort of went into this business of, 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 of trying to create a level of utility that that existed in that, that worked in existing channels or in existing existing markets but actually as the technology matured and as chat gpt arrived and gen ai came on board we found that we can people were starting to use our digital people as kind of reprompting them in different directions like taking the, the the one that we had on soul machines website and they were reworking that to be a sleep coach giving it a brief to say i would like you to be this you know so that kind of looking for that personal use case that you know making a digital person that is adaptable and because the technology is really geared towards being able to connect with the viewer emotionally or respond you know in terms of expression that in appropriately um it works really well in those areas where you don't want judgment or you want a response or you want to see if things work. And, and once you layer in uh, ChatGPT, um, you're starting to kind of have this kind of fusion of an experience that is a little bit unique. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm excited to see what other use cases you guys come up with too over time. So when you were developing this, you're, you're basically building stuff, you know, at the forefront of technology here. AI is exploding now. I know we've had it for a long time, but uh, talk to me a little bit about what it's like leading a product team around something that's so new, right? You're, you're not sure, 
ChatGPT, you know, came out, wowed everybody. People are coming up with different LLMs every single day. AI is advancing super fast. Now we've got um, Sora out there with the video yeah. creation. You know, the pace of this, it's so rapid. How do you keep up, you know, with the technology and how do you anticipate what's going to happen and take bets against that? Yeah, it's cha it's a challenge. Um, we've been fortunate because I think at this stage, we, we've been fortunate because we have, uh, we've been able to ride the advances. You know, previously, um, we've spent a lot of time focusing on how the face of the digital person looks and the, and the, and the production of those assets. And we spent less time on the conversational creation because we could not compete with Google and IBM and Microsoft on, on their platforms for NLPs and, and, and that effort to create the conversational corpus just takes a lot of time and a lot of expense. So really last year for us, um, we were in an ideal position that we could pivot away from the dependency on, on those platforms and unlock um, more customers or more potential for experimentation for our customers with 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 plugging into chat gpt um just reduce they just reduce the time to market for our customers and also for us internally to be able to experiment and to, to prove things so we kind of had these two platforms that we we made a bet originally that that the that the effort in scale was going to be on the creation of the the avatar itself and then hopefully someone else would would speed up the creation of the conversational con content which is which is what we've seen so we're kind of at that point now. The challenge we have is, is to sort of be continually adaptable to new LLMs that come on board. The next stage really is multi-modality where we have, we have aspects of that in our platform. So a digital avatar can actually see you and it can see your reaction and it can see your room and see what's going on, how it perceives those items and how that gets fed back to the LLM is sort of the, the next stage for us in our evolution. So really being able to capture content in the real world through the avatar and um, in the digital world for on the website and then take it or in the, in the place where it sits and then taking that back to the LLM. So that's the, that's the challenge that we've got and we're trying to work on at the moment. Um, from a team perspective, in terms of working in that space, um, I think the, the challenge is pretty consistent for product people here as it is in in other areas it's about focus and it's about prioritization and it's about being able to pick and quantify the the best bets for your market at at that time you now what's the biggest opportunity for growth for us where can we target um, where do we need to target i should say to move the company forward and i think the challenges are pretty consistent um it's just a little bit more dramatic, I think, because the platform's unstable. There's new things coming in. It, you need a particular type of op uh, product operator to be able to adapt to those changes, but also not get caught up in the the, the gold rush to to, uh, to the new and shiny, right? Which is where everyone's going and quantifying that somehow. Um, so yeah, and I think I think it's. Yeah, I think I think that's that's pretty much the the, the truth of it is that the more um, dramatic and and uh, changeable the landscape is, the kind of the more the basic skills of sort of of being a good product person come to the fore. You know, intuition, focus on what's important, think about the customer. Where does this add value? You know, is this helping us retain customers? Is this gonna is this gonna change the bottom line? Those same questions are consistent. Um, just maybe a little bit harder to to quantify. Especially coming from an organization where it sounds like, you know, this was research focused. A lot of people were like, I, I guess it, it kind of built out of, can we do this? How do we do it? How do we create these things, right? A product kind of searching for a problem. Yeah. How do you keep the company, you know, as a chief product officer in check with uh, not running after every new shiny thing that you're just you know, talking about how do you make sure that things are like focused and there's a strategy and, and you're not just chasing all the new things that could be out there. 
I wish I had the answer to that because it's the it's it's the constant it's the constant struggle. Um, I can tell you how we try, um, and it was a con- literally a conversation yesterday, a Slack message, just as I was I was going to bed yesterday about you know a brand new feature that we really must need to do because it's a differentiator and it's going to have a major impact and and it's exactly what our customers are going to need um, from from a couple of the engineering leads. And you you just you just break it down with with a, a simple set. In that instance, you break it down to the to the to the customer needs. You kind of introduce where does the value get added? How does this change what we're trying to do? How is this more important than these other ten priorities that you already know that we need to do? So just kind of context setting, I think, is critical. And kind of that education piece and constantly educating the teams around why we're doing what we're doing and trying to re- reinforce that knowledge for them so they have the reference point to come back to. From an organization, really the prioritization process, we introduced that two years ago, we worked with a really good um, uh, operations officer who came on board and really helped us restructure how we do ops. And it's like, I, I know that you've been doing a lot of work in this area and, it's, and it resonates hugely because I think that piece of the business, that operations layer is so critical. And getting that right is, was just a game changer for us. What types of things uh, are you doing on the ops layer that really made a difference? So, it, I mean, it was chaos. It was the Wild West beforehand. So really, it was just a simple putting product to the kind of as the, as the gating system for prioritization. You know, anyone can raise uh, a priority against the business, but then just having a format and a forum for executive leadership to make decisions on prioritization and then to have an open discussion about why are we doing these things? And if you want to do this, what are we not doing? Because before that, we had uh, a method of working where it was just every two weeks there was new priorities and shift in focus and this customer wanted this, so we have to do this. And there was no, there was no opportunity for growth. So having that kind of level of simplistic process put in place where it was just a case of roles and responsibilities were very clear, uh, a process for prioritization, an opportunity to discuss and to highlight um, the importance of new possible priorities or the changes or the impact of those changes. Um, and, and then also just a roadmap that people can refer back to. I know not everyone does a long-term roadmap and I know like we're a little bit out of date and, and that's us, but having an artifact that people can point to that is alive and we can see how things are evolving and changing has been so useful. It's been super useful. It stresses along the line, uh, along, sorry, the stresses along the line there, of course, but really just having that structure, um, means that there's a space for conversation and things are done in the open rather than engineers change minds and shift off or requests come from different spaces. You know, I always think it's interesting how when people think about, you know, cutting edge technology and high growth products and, you know, startups in the early kind of messy days that they think there's a, you know, that that process or or ops like that don't fit into those companies, right? I think there's this kind of like myth out there, like it's messy. That's just how we do it. How do you balance like keeping people innovative with not putting too much ops or too much process in there? Like what's your what's your careful balance to allow people to still like explore and still experiment and and where do you draw the line there? I think in regards to sewing machines, I think we're fortunate because the platform itself is still very experimental at this stage. And that's really part of our product strategy where we we're kind of putting a big bet on bringing the Gen AI technology and the avatar technology together and to build a platform for experimentation is really going to be a space where we're going to, we're going to find out more about our potential customers, find out more about what works, and then also find out things for ourselves. You know, one of the big challenges that we had previously is we couldn't really experiment with our technology because, um, it's research heavy. It's the the underlying technology needs refactoring because of the dependencies from the past and from the proprietary tech, um, which we're trying to shift at the moment. But but it was very slow to make any changes and, and experiment. So we could not kind of make those big changes. Everything was kind of very monolithic. So I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but really that level of experimentation is kind of ingrained into what we've got. And we've now kind of unlocked speed 
internally to be able to test quickly, not just dependent on engineering teams, but also within the product team to sort of use our tool to build a different use case, to publish that on the platform, get feedback from customers, move, move really quickly, get customer insights directly into the engineering teams, remind them of the problems that we're trying to solve, kind of how we can fix that. And I think if you can do that, if you can work on a platform that is you know, at the cutting edge, but you're bringing in real feedback from, from customers, uh, from users, that kind of helps shape and retain that kind of uh, sense of what you're doing rather than, uh, rather than it being, let's just go after this new shiny thing. And that will be cool to do some of that. And let's have, you know, minority report style graphics, you know, so it's really just about kind of, I think, just bringing users in to help us experiment and, and put them at the center of the work that we're doing. I love that you bake it into your product. And I think that's key. I, I think where some people don't understand about startups or like dealing with things in high uncertainty, especially in the AI realm or whatever is new technology and stable platforms, as you call them, which is a nice, nice way to say it. Um, when you're like in that field of uncertainty, the b- best thing you can do is act, right? Like throw something out there based on some evidence, right? See how customers react to it. And a lot of times I think instead people are trying to gravitate towards hard quantitative facts and say, hey, you know, give me all the data that you could possibly say to prove that this is a thing we should build and that doesn't usually exist. So I love that you designed your platform as a way to kind of say, hey, let's throw this out there and see how people react to it in a lightweight way um, and still get some data before we decide to commit. That's, that's like such a great way to, to build a startup and be able to iterate on it. How, how do you kind of think about, you know, getting the, the, getting the customer feedback, targeting the customers on it? I, I feel like that's a second part that people get nervous about when it comes to startups is like, and especially, you know, ones where you need that feedback desperately, um, targeting people and making them actually say like, yeah, I'll pick up the phone and talk to you or I'm, I'm very willing to give you feedback on this. How do you, how do you navigate those things? I think once again, I think once again, we've been lucky because of a few choices that were made on a, on, on the approach that Sun Machine took to business over the last few years. So we've had long-term partners who have worked in very much being attracted to us because you know a few years ago AI was the big thing, and then something else was the big thing, and now AI is back. But we kind of rose um, that wave initially of businesses want to be into, wanting to be part of of the AI movement and seeing what's out there, see what's coming next and the metaverse, et cetera. Um, so long-term relationships with research labs in other businesses has been very useful for us because there's been an audience using, using our tools. It's been a challenge as well because um, the one thing that we find is um, our tooling is very it was very internally based originally. It was built for us to help us make stuff. And then we put it into customers' hands. You know, some of the customers I just, I just talked about. And then we tried to fix the tool for those customers. So the balance there that we're finding at the moment is supporting those existing customers with real needs for them and their business or the experiments or the, the use cases that they're, they're looking at. And balancing that against trying to find new opportunities and making um, our product better, looking for that product market fit, kind of fixing the end user experience, kind of moving it away from just supporting what we have to to tackling new markets. And that's, I think that's the big challenge of kind of balancing those two things. Um, we're fortunate to get the feedback from customers there, but then you layer in new feedback from new customers and, and uh, new audiences. Um, and that's kind of where we are at the moment. As I think I mentioned previously, um, we just opened up the platform so that there's a, a free a freemium uh, tier where you can come on board and you can experience you know without deploying um, we're getting a lot of information from customers who are coming on board there about what they want and lots of learnings lots of surprises but they have very different needs from maybe the legacy enterprise customers that we've got you know, who already exist so kind of balancing that feedback between the two the two audiences is 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 where we see it at the moment. It's really interesting because I, I feel like a lot of companies get to that crux too, where you will have the people who started with you and then you're trying to figure out how to expand or maybe how to reposition or anything like that. And then you've got these new users who are coming out there and you have to try to weigh your product strategy. Like, are we going after enterprise customers, 
even though they're legacy, are we trying to expand there? Are we trying to do new markets? Um, and I feel like everybody has kind of a system to start to think through what way they should go. How, how do you think about balancing those two things? And what types of questions are you asking when you're trying to shape your product strategy and, and really narrow down your ICP? Yeah, so um, that's exactly where we are at the moment, I think. Um, sort of literally elbow deep in, in plowing through that now because we're still, at the, we're taking on board um, the freemium customers. We have kind of our pioneer who are the, the middle of the road and, and then we have our enterprise that are still kind of more legacy and, and, and spend more money for a very white glove service. So we, we're kind of analyzing those different data points that we have at the moment and looking at where are the opportunities to experiment and to measure the impact. Um, I'll give a good example, really, like, and this is kind of um, lessons learned from trying to test things. We, as I mentioned, we, we just opened up our freemium tier um, and we've had a huge amount of free customers come on board, you know, lots of month on month growth. Um, the challenge there is the turnaround for um, people turning into paying customers actually reduced from our previous tiers where we had, it was a free trial that you would come aboard and then convert. So we've kind of lost that conversion because we, we went too far into the free tier mode. Now, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing because we kind of race to build the free tier and it's something that we need and we kind of we're going to refactor things so that we can bring people in into the right packages into into a, a different approach for our, our pricing package um but the challenge has been kind of and the challenge will be is to how do we optimize for that how do we how do we optimize for the right people coming into the into the platform how do we define our icp um who are the people that are going to benefit the most from our technology? Where are we going to find the growth markets? Um, and I think we're still in that place of kind of building that platform where we can kind of experiment and shift the dial and see which sticks, see, see what sticks um, to try to, to try and bring that back into the product. It's, it's super early days because like I say, it's really just been sort of the last six months where we've had this platform available to start gathering that level of information to measure that against our existing insights. Um, but that's really the next stage for us. Nice. And this is not your first experience building on an unstable platform at the pace of AI either. You, you've worked for other companies as well. Uh, what did you take from them into Soul Machines? I think really um, my biggest learnings is, or came from working in two companies, really. I worked for um, I originally started my career working for um, a, what we would have called back then as a, a small startup, but it was before startups were invented. So it was just a couple of guys who came out of an art college and were working for the BBC, making creative content for for branded content for the BBC, a lot of the Wallace and Gromit comment. Um, and that was awesome because that was, I mean, I'm going to age myself because that was CD-ROMs. So that was just as the internet was, was about, was, was starting. Um, but I loved it. I loved it at that stage because there was no rules. There was no kind of, um, nothing was defined. We were just trying to get this content onto this small medium uh, and and reach a market. You know, that sort of kind of cutting edge, doing a bit of everything, wearing multiple hats. You were an animator, an audio recorder, or, uh, you know, trying to find the best way to compress graphics, you know, straight out of college and doing everything. That was kind of the... The biggest, the biggest learning for me, and that sort of went with me as I moved into Intel. Really, um, at Intel, it was the same sort of thing. It was a, it was a company that was acquired by Intel to build a full stack operating system. So this was pre iPad for um, Intel's cheap netbooks. They were like small laptops that they were trying to sell into developing markets. Yeah, and they didn't, they didn't want to spend the hundred bucks licensing that Microsoft were charging for Windows. So they wanted a new operating system. So we were a team to build, you know, we, we were placed, we were put in place to build this operating system that could replace Windows. Um, and the thing that I learned, I guess, from all of those, that those experiences um, were just kind of really about kind of um, putting in practice, like common sense, really. It's strange that, you know, you kind of talk about common sense as being, as being 
not very common, but really like trusting your int intuition about what users want, about how things are going to work is kind of studying the data, kind of getting engineers to see users using your platform as quickly as possible. That was a big game changer at Intel because we had a big group of engineers who knew the answers and there was a, an instantaneous change the moment that we put them in a room with users doing diary studies on the things that they were building. Like actually just seeing the reaction of these engineers working, uh, like looking at real users, trying to make stuff with, with what they were working. And that's something I go back to constantly, you know, always go back to bring real people into, into your day to day, into the work that you do, because it does, it does the work for you. You know, it really does. I think a lot of people have a question about how to balance that, right? You want your, engineers and the rest of the team to come out and listen to customers, see the work, do all those different things. How do you balance that with their day job? I get this question all the time for product managers. Like, what's, what's enough, right? What's enough to bring people into the field? What's enough to like show them what's going on? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I think we're, I think I'm fortunate in the role because there's so much wrong, oh, not so much wrong, but there's like so many things that could be improved and there's some fundamental challenges that we have. So it's, it's very easy to insert kind of at, at strategic points, um, user research into the process and kind of educate people into that. We tend to do stuff at quarterly planning, you know, we'll bring use cases in or we'll bring feedback from customers and we'll do it on a three month cycle. So then you can plant uh, the seeds into the engineering team's minds at that cycle. We're doing this because of this and there's a, there's a playback and you can play it back. And a lot of the time the engineering team sort of take that on board and, and, and become advocates for, for it themselves. And, and I think that comes back to your previous question, really, um, about things that I've learned and, and things that are beneficial. I think the key thing about working in this space is really make advocates with the engineering teams for what you're trying to do. You know, don't be that CEO product person where you're telling them what to do. They're interested in product. They want to do better work. You're there to help their life be easier, help them understand that. Um, and I think really that helps so much if you can kind of engage on them at that level they can also do the job for you that they become advocates for your work and they also kind of repeat the things that you say or that you think or the reasoning there it answers the questions for them and then they will hopefully answer questions to their co colleagues and and you build consensus that way um and i think that's super powerful i agree i think getting developers on your team to understand what you're doing and be your advocate is probably one of the best things that you do as a product person. So I love Absolutely. to hear you say that. And you you actually come from a design background too, right? Yes, sort of. I guess it's been a lot. It was a long. It was a long time ago. Um, and and I'm probably um, if you ask some of the designers on my team, they will doubt that ever happened. Um, but yeah, my my original background was was uh, in design, and that's where I was trained. Um, and that's kind of the the roots. So it's really quite quite non traditional for a CPO, I think, to to come from from that background. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you think that you know, gives you um, as a chief product officer? Like, how has that helped shape who you are as a chief product officer? How does it shape how you lead? Um, for me, like, I, I was always a hybrid UX product person. So I, I never had the design separated out from product for like the longest time. And I didn't realize there were two, two separate things. So I always approach like all problems from a UX problem. Like that's, that's how I get up to speed on products. That's how I, I see things. It's the way it's designed and the way that people interact with it. I'm curious, how that's shaped, you know, how you lead product teams and think about product strategy and, and get up to speed on products. Yeah, I think I think the key part is is the user research is one that, that we spoke about. I think that's my my leaning towards that um, is is super critical there. I think um, looking for motivations. Why why are people? I always think about motivations, not just in the in the design of a product, but also in the in in the day-to-day -day working with other people, you know, managing people or, or, or having challenging conversations with stakeholders, you know, what are their motivations, understanding um, where they're coming from, what they're trying to do. So that kind of has a dual benefit, I think, that came from user experience of trying to understand what a user wants to do and what they're trying to do. 
looking at insights. Um, I had a real privilege of working with some really, really smart researchers who no, don't just do user research, but do user insights and sitting in on those interviews with people when they, you know, navigate kind of conversations with real people to kind of understand what their values are and kind of looking at the opportunities there. And that, that, that was early on in my career and that kind of seeded how I operated as a, as a designer. Um, and I, and bringing that straight into, into the, into the work I do today. And then I think probably strategically, I think you design everything, right? You know, you try to design you, whether or not it's about lining everything up on Miro in, you know, perfect form or kind of trying to build structures or bring in org organization or, or order to organizations, I should say. I think there's a level of kind of focusing on detail that came from that mindset of kind of drilling into kind of, you know, going from a very high level to a very pixel, pixel perfect um, approach. And I think those combination of those behaviors mean that you kind of approach things a little bit differently. You kind of lean a little bit more intuition on things that feel right. You look for things that feel good. You look for an emotional response. You look for engagement. You look for a connection. Um, and I think that works in, for me anyway, that works with communicating with people as well as as well as working with teams or, or, or trying to build things. Coming from a design background, what did you have to learn or what did you have to get exposed to, I guess, um, to move into the CPO role to be successful? Um, so much and still so much still to learn. I think um, just having a better understanding of kind of technology, I think, you know, because I think coming from a creative background, technology is always quite challenging for me. Um, being interested in that level of detail, um, understanding kind of uh, the way that product managers think uh, and some of the techniques. And uh, you learn that from some, some really good books. Thank you very much for that. Um, but I think that there's an element of just kind of um, being more sort of, I think more open to discussion and less driven by delivery. I think that's the big one for me. Um, I'm quite an opinionated person. I was as a designer um, and you kind of, and you sort of thrive on that level of trying to drive your idea forward and the challenge of doing that. But really that's only kind of one mode of operation. The other mode is to kind of listen to the good ideas from other people. It's kind of absorb things from people who are technically uh, more knowledgeable than you in different fields. Um, and trust them and their decision making. Um, I think that's that's probably probably the biggest piece for me. I think that's really good advice for aspiring designers who want to be CPOs out there right. to to listen to that. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your advice for companies that want to be more, let's say, forward facing. Right? They want to be at the the front of technology, especially when it comes to AI these days. I think every company needs think they need an AI strategy. So <laughs> they're trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to integrate it, what to do with it. Um, you've worked in a massive organization like Intel, um, still future facing technologies. You've worked for startups, you work for agencies. And I know that you created this uh, kind of framework as well for thinking through how your future facing business should operate and what that should look like. Can you tell us a little bit about the principles in that framework and how you use them to you know, guide your teams or guide your business? So the advice I, I would give is kind of like, just it's just really about introducing prioritization. So it's not really a groundbreaking piece of advice, so it's not really like massively unique, but like establishing that structure for, you know, for successful operations across the business where you can grow healthy and happy teams, right? It's not just about the structure for kind of delivery is the structure of growth of the individual is massively critical. If you don't have happy people operating in your organization, then you're not going to be successful. You know, the next piece is like adopting a process that's familiar to the team that already exists. You know, you don't have to kind of take something off the shelf. You don't have to do kind of prescribed agile. You kind of just need to kind of 
do something that works and that people can move towards and you can build an agreement and, and, and measure the success of that team, however that works for you guys. And that can evolve as you, as you move forward. The third piece is, I think we mentioned this, is just put customers into the conversation as quickly as you can, put users in there so people can see that and you can leverage the insights that, that are gathered from there. Um, and then really use the above just to define a clear set of outcomes, you know, target a North Star, kind of have somewhere that you can use immediate priorities that you can start moving towards. And it kind of brings the organization together and you can then frame your strategy and your vision and your roadmap against those. Um, even if it's wrong, just moving fast and kind of moving towards something and then you can evolve as an organization. It's super critical you're going to get it wrong you know failure is a big part of everything that we do that's the only consistency that we have right we know something's going to fail um more often than not but if you're moving and you're making progress then you're gathering data and you're learning uh, and you're evolving and i think i think that's the most important thing great thank you so much darren for that advice and thank you for being on the product thinking podcast if people want to learn more about you and soul machines where can they go so you can go to soulmachines.com and please sign up to uh, Digital DNA Studio and have a play. Um, or you can find me on LinkedIn as like DPJ Wilson. Um, that's the best place to contact me. Great. And we will put all of those links in our show notes at theproductthinkingpodcast.com. So go to productthinkingpodcast.com, find Darren's episode, and we will have all those links in there. Thank you for listening to the Product Thinking Podcast. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode and another great guest. In the meantime, get all your questions into me at dearmelissa.com. I'm happy to answer any of your questions about product management, and we will see you next time. Thanks for coming, Darren. Thank you very much.